Theo, welcome to Dow Talk. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, of course. Maybe you can just get us started by telling me a little bit about your background and how you ended up working in crypto and Web3 and on uh, VitaDAO. Absolutely. So my background is in information systems, so with sort of business and informatics combined. And I was looking especially at organizational theory, concepts like open innovation, user innovation, how companies leverage technology to be better, be more innovative, be more user-friendly and so forth. But of course, Web2 technology in, in academia, at least at the time. And then I came across the DAO in 2016. That was really my first touch point with the blockchain space. And I got, just got really excited because it is really open innovation on steroids. Web3 is all about openness, innovativity, including the user and so forth. So, so that got me hooked. And then from the DAO, I learned about Ethereum. From Ethereum, I learned about Bitcoin and about blockchain. So kind of the other way around. And I've also really been interested in science, like in my field in organizational science. So that sort of led me into the decentralized science space as in reinventing science itself, itself, if you will. That's that's amazing. I love that you encountered DAOs first. <laughs> there aren't, I feel like most people, you know, maybe they learn about Bitcoin, then Ethereum, then blockchains, then DAOs. He <laughs> did, did the opposite. That's really cool. I, I think so too, yeah. To be fair, it was quite late. Like I'm not one of those super early joiners, but uh, I did see DAOs first. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> that's amazing. So, so you kind of had this interest in DAOs, Ethereum, blockchain, and you have also an interest in science and research. Did those two kind of come together somehow? Or like, how, how did you end up finding out about or deciding to found uh, VitaDAO? Right. So it was sort of connected. So I was doing research at the time about DAOs, writing my master's thesis on DAOs. So I, I was using the term, but had to use it scarcely because the it was not really a, a known term in literature, of course. So anyways, doing that research, I was mostly talking to DAO um, organizations at the time, Colony and Aragon, for example, who were there already in 2017. But I was also looking beyond the DAO space and to other communities looking around decentralized coordination. And there was a group in Berlin called Blockchain for Science, led by Sönke Bartling. And um, I was in Berlin at the time, so I got involved in that community too. And that really got me into the science aspect of, of blockchain specifically. That's amazing. And so I guess like maybe tell me a little bit more about what VitaDAO is specifically I and mean, what you're trying to accomplish. Sure. So, so VitaDAO is a new DAO. Um, actually, we just got one year old. Oh, congrats. Um, so congrats. Thank you. First birthday. <laughs> Thanks. It, it is. Yeah. So it's not that new anymore. It's a community funding longevity research. So it is all about uh, the community to curate and decide what research projects to fund. And the purpose is really advancing human lifespan and health span to make people live healthier for longer, but also longer. Um, and I'm really excited about that course. And um, it turned out that there are many decentralized science studies you could do, do and you should do, and there'll be many more. But the thing is, longevity was this really interesting intersection where a lot of crypto people seem to be interested in. And that was just a great way to get started. And we are quite impressed by the community, how it has grown, how many people joined, really intrinsically motivated, just found us by themselves. So apparently it was this pretty good niche for decentralized science to get started, but I expect many more DAOs to come. That makes a lot of sense. I've noticed the same thing just anecdotally, that there are many people in crypto who have an interest in longevity. And I also, I, I'm not super familiar with science and science funding, but I've heard that maybe longevity doesn't get all of the research funding that it could in other environments. So maybe also there's a need. There's kind of like a gap in the market that, that DAOs can help fill too, right? That's exactly right. So yeah, I should say that a, a huge argument to, to have this DAO was, was and is also the existing system of um, national health institutions in the US and, and beyond the business industry practice of pharma companies and other actors all of them together are sort of 
structured in a way where they usually uh, treat disease rather than prevent. Mm. And just the logic of public health systems and the logic of, of big pharma tends to prefer well, treating chronic diseases and, and let them occur rather than fund expensive, risky research about preventing them in the first place. Because then, of course, you could make some money with preventing them. But treating a chronic disease for 30 years or so is surely more profitable. So there was and is this a niche in, in the current system that is disincentivizing individuals. And, and there are individuals caring about this, truly caring about the course, but they just had a hard time realizing themselves and, of course, also making a living. And with VitaDAO, we hope to fill this gap. There is something magical about like Ethereum and the concept of DAOs in its ability to bring together many individuals to accrue significant funding. I think in the legacy world, um, whether it's science, research, business, even nonprofit funding, it's almost like to raise a lot of money, there needs to be this big formal organization, which yeah, may be challenging in, in certain areas like longevity to get big organizations to support it. But it, it's crazy how much like interest and also just funding blockchain seems to be able to create. Sometimes it's silly stuff like when the community raised $40 million in less than a week to, to buy it, to try to buy a copy of the U.S. Constitution. That was more like fun than anything else. But like it shows a lot of power, right? Like the sort of equation of the level of infrastructure that exists, which is basically none besides Ethereum, the amount of time it took to raise the money, which is like five days times the amount of money raised is like pretty crazy, <laughs> you know, like it's definitely like a novel mechanism. And so super exciting to see people trying to apply that to maybe like areas of like fundamental science that are actually quite important to humanity. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a good point. I also find it so remarkable how, how much and how quick funds can be raised. Of course, it's, it's incredible. It also makes me think, sometimes it makes me skeptical what are exactly the expectations and motivations behind that? So, of course, we do have a well lot of people who care about funding basic research and they provide funds. We have organizations, people caring about public goods and they provide funds. We may have some, some speculators, you never really know. But then um, in the broader DAO and crypto space, well, we'll have to see in five or 10 years how much willingness to, to give money is still there mm. if or when the you know, always go up, numbers go up, principle, if it turns out to be uh, false, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so that is something to be skeptical of. While it lasts, I think it's a good idea to use it for impact outs and for good causes, yes. but also to be prepared to keep your run rate going in a time like now, really, yes. when funding is scarce. That's a fantastic point. And I think speculation certainly has like its its use cases. It tends to like fund projects that maybe otherwise wouldn't get funded, like just in general, right? And helps build out infrastructure for crypto. But as you point out, it has a big downside. And we've seen some projects maybe start out with good intentions, but the way their mechanism is designed, it attracts speculators because it creates the potential for rapid acceleration in like accumulating assets. And that can actually be really detrimental because then the community becomes more speculators than the original idea. And it makes it sort of, it ends up kind of like killing the DAO or the community. So I think you're right, like trying to be really careful to design for communities that are really focused on like the mission of the DAO is very important, which hopefully will help some with the sustainability too, because people will, yeah, just be more interested to stick around if they're there for the right reasons. Yeah, fully agree. And just one more point on that. Even if a DAO and, and the core team is well-intentioned, I do think that today there's, in so many cases, a lot of ambiguity around the technological implementation of the management of funds and the long-term promises made. Mm. So, well, small contracts sound all good and great, but in, in effect, we do see a lot of multi-sigs, which I think make complete sense, but in effect, it's it's a core team managing funds and, well, 
they could rug pull totally and, and they do sometimes yes, right yes. or like the luna example i'm not that familiar but, but um the, the south korean founder team probably doing some insider business and certainly not living up to their promises if you expect a decentralized community governed project so what i'm saying is another thing i would love to, the space to work on is you know not only having the technology be transparent in theory but try to make it 100% work in practice and we'll never really get there to 100% but we should really expand our our goal of you know beyond mathematical proofs we need them too but then we also need to account for the user we need to account for malicious individuals who have the private key of a project or, or so and get the definition of decentralization beyond the technological level so that it, it can really be trusted also in a social space. And I realize that's extremely complicated, but I, I think we have to face reality. I think you're right. I totally agree. I think the word DAO is used too much. There are many projects that use the word DAO that are trying to generate some credibility by saying this. But if you look at objectively at the mechanism and the community and the way the funds are custodied, there's little that's decentralized about it. I'm curious, like, how are you all thinking about that at Vita DAO? Like, will you tell me a little bit about how the protocol is designed, if there is a protocol, how governance works, how you think about, yeah, trying to strive for the decentralization that you mentioned? Sure. So Vita DAO is really this a funding collective, right? So we started quite lean initially just with a multi-sig and we still do have that today in the spirit of gradual decentralization. And I do realize I contradict my earlier points, although I would really say, I think the concept makes a lot of sense if you genuinely work towards decentralization and do so in a responsible way. Because if you do put a lot of funds in a wallet or multi-sig that is governed by a DAO, then a lot of things are at stake. Well, it's really a bug bounty in the um, amount of the treasury size, right? Yes. So we should probably do that at some point, but we really need to be sure it works. So to your question, at VitaDAO, we still have a multi-sig managed by a larger core team. This so-called core team consists of stewards of each working group. We have a longevity working group. And then we have tokenomics, governance, operations, um, tech and legal and others, communications, of course. And we do have partners, for example, Molecule, that's a company and soon a DAO that is providing us with the IP NFT framework. That is a t technology we use to really work with IP in a Web3 native way in the sense of technology and, and protocols. We do use the Molecule protocol Uh, for the IP NFT technology, which is really the novelty of, of MetaDAO investing um, funding research through Web3 native assets. Tell me a little bit more about that. How does the Molecule IP NFT kind of me mechanism work? Absolutely. So it's a really interesting concept consisting of multiple layers. So there is the, the on-chain layer of an NFT, which refers to some in storage where private information is, is kept, the sensitive IP information. And, and it also connects to another layer of a legal contract, which um, is signed by a legal entity. And that is the purpose of that is also to make it better enforceable. Although we have to say it has never been tested whether it's enforced, can be enforced in court, but the concept seemed quite convincing and we'll see if we'll put it to the test at some point um, and then I'm confident it will work out. That makes a lot of sense. So is the idea that people who basically purchase the NFT, that's a vehicle for investing in the future outcome of the research that's being funded by the NFT? That's exactly right. Okay. So in principle, exactly that. We usually define that in every deal whether it is, you know, all the royalties emerging from a product or all the products emerging from research or to what percentage 
RitaDAO would get a profit from that. So this is really up for negotiation. But in principle, RitaDAO is entitled to the benefits from the output of a research project. How do research projects begin and go through a life cycle with VitaDAO? Is it almost like a governance proposal or something? Or how, how does it work that a research project begins and then and kind of goes through your funding collective? Yeah, great question. So we have a three-phase model here. The first phase is very informal, very non-on-chain. It is the longevity research working group full of PhDs and scientists who evaluate research. So they scout for interesting projects. They bring them into the group. They evaluate them. They also get feedback from experienced advisors and VCs and, and professors. And then this longevity research group in the first step curates and drafts a proposal, which goes on our discourse forum for the second phase, where it is being discussed with the whole VitaDAO community. And that is also not on-chain, obviously. It, the point is really to include every community member. It is also not really one person, one vote, but it's sort of an approximation of that. And the really important part are the comments, of course, in discourse. So then it is being discussed, it is being refined once it's gotten to a point where there is sort of consensus. Technically, it needs to pass a certain degree votes. Then it moves on to the third and final phase, with, which is a snapshot vote. So a token weighted vote with the Vita governance token. So in, in essence, we have this expert based first phase. We have the community based second phase and the token weighted third phase, which I feel like is an interesting way of combining the current possibilities, which are quite limited. I hate token weighted voting. I love reputation weighted voting. It's just extremely hard to achieve. So considering that, I'm pretty happy with that for now. 